bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Transcription services provided by transcribeme.com. Visit them on the web at transcribeme.com slash beancast for up to 25% off. That's transcribeme.com. Episode 513, a lousy negotiation tactic. Monday, September 24th, 2018. It's time for this week's edition of The Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. Adobe just bought Marketo for nearly $5 billion dollars leading many to wonder whether we're just at the start of a wave of big consolidation in the marketing automation sector. What are the possibilities? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, why trust of media agencies continues to flag. Whether VR offers hope for improving customer service. Amazon nipping at the duopoly. Plus this week's Ad Fail 5. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the social and influencer communications lead for global markets at IBM, Ms. Brandy Boatner. Boy, that's always hard to say your title. There's (laughs) so many words in it, so many words. It must be important. (laughs) It really is. I try to make it as long as possible so you know I have a lot of responsibilities, Bob. (laughs) I find that the the less letters you have in the name of a company, the longer the titles. (laughs) (laughs) It's very true. Very true. Now, also with us, she's led several New York ad agencies and is now a founding partner of brand culture and innovation consultancy, the HMS Beagle, Ms. Lynn Power. Lynn, welcome to the program for the very first time. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we've got a lot to talk about right off the bat, and I want to jump right into this first topic. Big rumblings in the industry this week as Adobe announced that they were buying Marketo for nearly $5 billion with a B dollars to round out their marketing automation footprint and compete more effectively against Salesforce. At least that's what the press release says. Yep. Now, in spite of the obvious surprise over this price tag, Lynn, does this purchase make sense for them? Is it a smart move for them to purchase this company? And what are the outcomes for, you know, consolidating a player like Marketo into the Adobe architecture? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I I think there's always a question on consolidation consolidation anyway, right? Because anytime there are consolidations, it takes capabilities and sucks them off the market. And there's always a question as to whether or not the companies acquired can keep innovating to the degree that they were before. And and in Marketo's case, I think that was a little bit of a question. I think they had gotten a little bit, you know, off the game. Now, having said that, I think for Adobe, it makes a lot of sense because they are all about combining the creative suite of tools, and that's what they've been standing for forever, right? Creatives love them and know them, but now they've got the ability to do marketing automation and CRM and really um, lead generation so they can build a machine. The thing that I'm questioning, though, is content and data is not is not the answer. You know, It's part of the answer, and at some point... Um, are we going to see them realize that you actually need real insights and knowledge to fuel the content and data? And I wonder, would they, you know, do something like try to acquire a Kantar uh, to to boost that capability and really provide a one-stop shop for marketing? Or do they even go more bleeding edge with a startup like Current, C-U-R-R-N-T, which is about knowledge creation platform fueled by experts and do they try to go that route and uh, a, a, and at least provide some kind of front end uh, insight a, a capability attached to all this great marketing machine that they're now trying to build. I have so many questions for you having heard this because there's so <laughs> many things. You know, for the first and foremost that pops to mind um, 
is you really believe that they're going to go on a buying spree after spending $5 billion? It seems more likely that some of the other players would get into the buying mode and try to compete and bolster their own offerings, considering that Adobe is now rounding out their suite and is a serious competitor to the CRM engines of a lot of the other big players. Well, there's no question that the marketing machine can get rounded out, right? So, yes, I agree with you that other players are now going to go, shit, we need that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we need that, too. <laughs> Luckily, um, Cable says that word. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, and also do that. And, and I'm, I'm just being provocative for the future because I think, I think that's almost like going to be table stakes at some point. Do you know what I mean? And, and for them to really get ahead and to really think of themselves – as this, you know, uh, marketing solution. Um, it, it, uh, I just, you know, again, maybe it's my background from branding and agency world and strategy, but all that data is great. But if it's in a vacuum, it's, it's not. So I, I, I think I'm not suggesting they're going to go out and buy something tomorrow, but I think, um, this is part of a bigger plan perhaps is what I'm suggesting that, 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 that they are, more on that in a minute, because I want to really delve into that. But I think I want to turn to Brandy next, who I'm not mm. sure is the best person to ask all these questions of, considering the fact of who her employer is. But <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but, I'm very quiet. I was like, this, you got it. You're on a no fair. point of view on this one. I'm I don't sure. know what you're talking about. So yeah. I, 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 have, I have a lot of pointed questions, but I'm going to let you turn you loose first and offer your opinions on this purchase. What, what, what is your take on the state of the industry? and what this means to the consolidation race that may be coming. I mean, I mean, I, I do agree with, I agree with Lynn and I have a very, you know, different perspective around marketing automation, you know, with the capabilities that my company has, you know, we can track, you know, every marketing dollar we spend based on tools that we've created and, you know, kind of overlaid with our Watson technology. So, when I saw this and I was like, wow. And then to your earlier point, Bob, with the billion, I was like, wow, this, I, I guess like game on, like, this is okay. Mm -hmm. So this is what's happening. And what does that mean? Now, again, different perspective for us, for my company, but I think industry wise, again, I agree with, with Lynn, um, you know, her experience and what she's seen on the agency side, it, it now it's really, again, like, what are you going to do? Your data can't just live in a silo. What does this mean? And then if we look at like the race is on and now, we, you know, I guess you could say we've declared war, they declared war, so to speak. Well, who's going to win? I'm just kind of sitting on the sidelines like, hmm, this is all very interesting because we do a lot of our stuff in house. Right. But it is. It's pretty. It is. It's selling. Well, that brings up the, the big question in the room, because everybody's trying to be the one ring that rules them all. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why all these consolidations are happening, why so much expansion is going on in the marketing automation field. People want to be that one dashboard that does everything. And yet there is not a single company out there. Uh, at least not in any kind of sizable fashion that is using only a single tool. They all yeah. use a con conglomeration of Adobe and Salesforce and Marketo and uh, smaller players like Percolate and uh, a few of the other ones. I think it's called Edge. You know, the, there's there's so many different players out there in the marketplace involved with this. Is it even reasonable to think that one player lynn can become that one ring to rule them all given the fact that most of the companies out there that are using these tools are not buying into that philosophy i mean it's tough right because i feel like there's all this sort of vision out there of how easy it would be to just pull everything together and just make it under one thing and but they're you know we, we've seen time and time again that that's easier said than done. And I think it's the goal of what, what everyone wants, but it's, I mean, you, you had another uh, reference in, in what you sent us this week, which was um, around the, the ad ID consortium, right? Like getting one unique um, personalized identification that can be tracked back to you and do it in a way that's not creepy. That's, that's harder than, it's harder than it sounds. So um, I don't know. I don't know. 
That's my. <laughs> I mean, sure. Brand, Brandy, I mean, from your standpoint, I mean, your company is pursuing a strategy of wanting to be that one player eventually, right? I mean, it's just like everybody wants to go for that um, in their offering. So does it make sense? I mean, I know this may not be, again, the right person to ask this question to, but, <laughs> you know, what kind of pushback are you getting from your clients and how do you answer those questions about, the fact that no platform can do everything as uh, elegantly and as simply as a lot of these players are saying they can. So, no, I, I do agree. So, again, we the, the part of the business that is responsible for marketing automation and, again, clients is our Watson customer engagement. That is the part of our business, you know, that that handles marketing automation requests and for our clients. I can assure you if I were to, and I sit behind that team, so I, I hear them like on the phone and they're doing deals. I bet if I ask them tomorrow, hey guys, which which of our clients had you know questions about the Marketo deal? I guarantee you, all of them are going to say, oh, I had to get on the phone with so and so, or oh, I had. I bet they're. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine that our clients were asking about it. Um, I can tell you just again, just from what I see at the corporate lens, not going into the business unit lens as far as <clears throat> having one you know the one ring to rule them all we tell our clients that look the products that we're selling you for marketing automation it's not you know a magic bullet one size fits all but we are confident again given with watson capabilities and technology that we can do things other people can't do given that we have this capability but we never I, I don't believe we sell it like oh this is all you need you won't need anything else <laughs> it's just it is the end all be all um because to your point bob that's not where we are now if you look at just kind of how marketing as an industry is transforming and what this means for you know the marketing transformation that's what i'm saying everybody's now going to be like well i have to what it what does the modern marketing function look like you know, with, with the right technology. I don't necessarily know if it's going to be the one technology, but that's the question everyone's going to start asking. Like, what does this, what does this mean for us? Five years, three years, two years. What does this mean for us? You know, something that comes to mind when I talk, you mentioned digital transformation, Brandy, and it's mm -hmm. just like, and people who are involved with digital transform transformation have enough problems on their plate already and Lynn, you know, you deal with this with your clients. You talk about how uh, people can go through this process of changing their brand culture in order to embrace new technologies, embrace innovation. But does this really solve a brand's problem, having uh, uh, additional services that Marketo, already, uh, that Marketo offers? Or does it just acquire Marketo customers and it really doesn't do anything to sway someone who's using a Salesforce CRM database to come over to the Adobe platform to kind of unify, but just, just because it adds additional complication in the digital transformation? It's a good question. I'm not sure that they're going to be able to steal business from Salesforce that easily, to your point. And also, you know, once things are embedded into a system and a culture, it's often hard to change that. So there, there is there is that piece, although I'm sure there are plenty of new companies and startups all the time that this proposition would make sense for. Because I think one thing that I hear time and time again from clients these days, and this was like my life at JWT, right? They want sim simplification. They, they don't want to have, you know, 12 agencies or 20 agencies or 100 agencies or how, however many digital partners. They want things to be easier and more turnkey, so they will take. Okay, let me let me stop. Let me of, stop you right there yeah, because it's yeah. just like I think we we can't confuse the desire to simplify contacts in an agency relationship with the the use of a digital platform because it's just like it's it's not easy to change agency relationships, but it is vastly more easy than trying to change your, your platform, your, your marketing automation platform in any kind of sense, because then you have to deal with the cultural desire to use old tools as opposed to migrate over to the new tools. And you have all the complaints that go on and then you've got the holdouts and you've got all this stuff going on in the background. It's a, mu it's a much more complicated process. I would say I agree with you on change. So like going to, again, existing Salesforce you know, customers and telling them to change is hard, but going to new new prospects, it's a better story, frankly. It is. You know, you're, you're, you're connecting the dots for them. Let, so me, let me ask you this. I mean, it's just like not being on the front end of 
or, or the front lines of you know selling Salesforce, selling Adobe into the marketplace, how many holdouts can there possibly be who don't have any kind of a marketing automation platform? I, I mean, I at least no at the, idea. <laughs> you know, it no, seems right. like There's it seems like yet. everybody has some kind of involvement. Something that's true. That's true. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Or, or For sure. Brandy, what's your sense on the merger frontier? I mean, it's just like I, I, I know I kind of broached that subject with you, but do you th- see a lot more of these companies stepping into this this gap that's been created as a result of the Adobe merger with Marketo and saying we need to gather in all these other tools that are available and which tools are ripe for the picking? Do you have any sense of that? I mean, I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask once again, you know, but you know, maybe you might be able to offer some insight given that your position. So my only insight would say, I think, yes, that there is, I think this is going to continue to happen, that there is, you know, people and companies, particularly with technology and marketing automation, um, since, you know, we are living this wonderful connected life, whether you, you love it or hate it, that we live it. Um, so I do think, yes, that it, this will continue. As far as like the players in the space who might be, you know, thinking about moves like this, that I'm not, again, the right person for that. I would love to ask someone on my Watson CE team what they think about it. But I do, I do think this is just the beginning. I, I, I don't, I don't think that. Wow, that Adobe Marketo, uh, you know, acquisition was amazing. And then five years later, we don't see anything else. Maybe next year, two years, we're it, this is only the beginning. So that's just my personal opinion, just based on just trends in marketing. And, and, and the, again, just giving my insight, working at a technology company that is a, is a huge advocate of marketing automation. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn, who who in your book is ripe for the picking? I mean, is it going to be a consolidation with a whole bunch of smaller players or are some of the big players actually going to consolidate with each other mm-hmm. given this move? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I wouldn't be surprised if we see a, a, some of the big players consolidate, but but I also think, you know, it's, it's really easy. There's so many interesting startups out there and so many interesting players um, to pick off that you could – you could actually make a dent just starting there. So I, I agree with Brandy. I think we're going to see a lot, a lot of traction and movement as, as players try to line up capabilities in a more holistic way. You know, I, I'm on record as saying I believe that Microsoft is going to buy Adobe at some point. I think that that mm-hmm. makes the most sense in terms of, you know, marketing offering. And that that was true until the Marketo deal. Now suddenly Adobe has a lot of the things that Microsoft was offering to them if there was some kind of acquisition deal on the table. But it, it may also make the the Adobe offering that much more valuable to someone like Microsoft. Um and then someone else I was talking to this weekend suggested potentially that Amazon was the player who could take over an Adobe or something like that, which is an interesting outsider opinion, considering the fact that they run most of the web with AWS, you mm-hmm. know, adding a layer of marketing cloud on top of that makes a lot of sense for a player like Amazon. So, Well, not Absolutely. to mention that, I'm sorry, IBM Cloud also runs a lot of the technologies that people are running. Let's not count that out. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> cloud provider. Or I just want to make, you know, make it known that the IBM Cloud, a lot of people are running yeah. their on the IBM Cloud, particularly for marketing automation. I just wanted to throw that out there. I see the commercials, and yes, absolutely, my bad. <laughs> I have the IBM representative on, and I'm not mentioning IBM. So That's amazing. Uh, well, we're going to move on, and we're going to talk next about trust in media buying. It's at an all-time low. It just keeps getting lower. It's one of the topics that is high on mind of many of the people that I work with on a daily basis. But before that, we're going to do an ad quickly from our sponsor, AdRoll. I got this phone call about 5.30, 6 a.m., was tasked with devising a go-to-market strategy for a rebrand. 
We knew that we had resonated with those hikers or those surfers or skiers, but we needed to expand our reach and make sure that these people were able to go from the boardroom to the board with our sunglasses. AdRoll was definitely instrumental in getting this new brand out there, both from a prospecting and remarketing standpoint, and they kind of helped me break down how the funnel looked and how we wanted to position our messaging. I was getting slacks from everyone in the company when they'd see an ad somewhere in, like in the New York Times. Everyone was super stoked to see our new content and our new brand uh, creative out there. You know, they definitely helped me shine internally at Sunski from a marketing standpoint. To find out how Sunski and 37,000 other brands grow their businesses with AdRoll, visit adroll.com slash beancast. That's A-D-R-O-L-L dot com slash beancast. Well, just in case you thought the situation between media buying and advertisers was getting any better, a new study suggests that 40% of clients distrust their media buying partners which, if you're playing at home, is a drop of nearly 11% since last year. Lynn, we know why this is the case. We know about all the controversy that's gone on over the last few years. But why can't we fix this problem, and why are things getting worse? Uh, what's your opinion on this situation? So, um, yes, there's clearly an issue in media buying, but I actually pull back and I go, okay, trust is actually becoming a huge issue, period. Um, Edelman does a barometer every year on trust. I think they've been doing it for something like 17 years. And uh, HBR typically publishes it. And in the last year, um, I think they found that trust declined in business, media, government, and NGOs across the board, which is the first time that's happened. Um, on top of that, I think there's now like an unprecedented lack of confidence in leadership across the board, and people just don't trust businesses to do the right thing. So I, I feel like the media buying question is kind of wrapped up in this bigger ethos of what we're dealing with, frankly. Well, what's the percentage drop in trust overall? Because it, it seems that this drop is pretty precipitous when it's talking about media buying in particular. I mean, I, I agree with you. There is a problem with trust across the board, and that's going to affect all business relationships. But to be down 40% and then know that you dropped another 11% over the course of the last year, that seems like it's outside the ratio of normal drops in confidence that are going on across the, the marketing spectrum. I, I wish that was true, but I actually think the lack of confidence is pretty unbelievably high, <laughs> like 70%. Like the numbers are pretty bad. Mm. So, um, you know, when you actually look at it across the board, it, it's, it's pretty grim, to be honest. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. And we can all talk about those probably for hours and hours and hours because we feel it, too. Right. We're people, too. We feel this issue happening. Uh, but I think a big thing is, you know, fear of globalization, fear of companies focus on, uh, you know, financials and not on sort of corporate citizenship and doing the right thing and these are all issues that are just, you know, there's lots and lots of them. There's lots of reasons why people are anxious. But uh, I, I think there are some very specific things that are eroding our trust, um, in, in across, again, across the board. And I just think the media buying thing is, is just the latest um, casualty, if you, if you want to think about it that way, in the sense of, yeah, why would we trust them either? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Well, you, know I, what I mean? you make a really, really good point. And I think that that's absolutely um, a, a big factor in why this is going on and why we can't correct it. There's a general sense of distrust out there in the marketplace. And I can see why that would make it harder for media agencies to turn the corner. But Brandy, coming from a client perspective, I mean, I... I'm not going to ask you to speak on record on behalf of IBM, but why is it that agencies can't seem to get in bed with their clients again? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I'm not going to speak on, you know, why agencies can't get in, you know, bed from the client side. I can only, again, look at our agency relationships um, and our agency partners. I think that we have a good relationship um, with them, but I do think as Lynn was, you know, talking about transparency and trust, you know, we've had a long standing, we're talking about more than two decades 
that we've been with some of our agencies. Um, if you think about that from a relationship or like a marriage standpoint, it's a long time. I don't know what your 20th anniversary is or your 25th anniversary, you know, is when people celebrate. So, you know, those are really long standing relationships. Now, again, I can't speak for, you know, those who've maybe been with their agencies less than five years. And if there is, you know, kind of a transparency issue or a trust issue where you might not feel comfortable or you want to, you know, continue doing business or you want to bring more things in house or what have you, but it's just like, it's a relationship. Right. And so again, like I said, you know, we're coming, I'm coming from it from a standpoint of more than two decades with some of our agency partners. So it's, it's a mutual respect, but, you know, transparency plays a huge role in that, in that, you know, two decade relationship. And that, that brings up the uh, a follow-up question for you, which is, um, you know, if you have a longstanding relationship and that relationship has been built on everybody playing nice, but not really mm-hmm. telling the truth, um, you've got a, a, a large amount of distrust. You've got a large amount of anger and frustration brewing on both sides of this equation. So how much of this is purely based on the fact that agencies were outed for taking kickbacks as opposed to agencies saying enough is enough. We need to be paid for what we're doing. And, you know, we need to stop being negotiated into the ground by the procurement agents, uh, agents within the organization. So, I mean, both sides have distrust and both sides have dissatisfaction with the relationship how did they go to the table and make this better i mean that they, they just have to make it right it's it's not optional i don't think at this point like you said you know when do you say like enough is enough well I, I, we're looking at you know i feel like it's september 2018 2019 we can see it how long is the like? How long are you going to do this? Like, how long are you going to have a leg to stand on? And do you want to be called out? Do you want to be called out in a very public, very shameful way? Like, it just it has to stop. So both sides have to make that decision to say, you know what, this this might have been how it used to be, or this is what happened. But no, you know, now it's again enough's enough. Now we're bringing this to the table. This is what is. This is what isn't. And this is how we're going to move forward. It, it has to be a, a conscious decision on both on both sides. And Lynn, any additional thoughts on that? I mean, how uh, obviously you come from the agency side of the equation and you've sat across from procurement agents uh, a lot of times. And I'm sure you've experienced mm-hmm. a lot of the dissatisfaction that agencies feel about this, as well as being able to see as a consultant now the reality of client distrust how do you get past this? How do both sides get to a place where they're sitting at the bargaining table and they've got a satisfying resolution? Yeah, I mean, I kind of go back to some really basic fundamental things like really understanding the value equation of what you're providing. Um, you know, if if the, the expectations from the client are on one side and the agency are on another side, well, of course, you're going to have people that are unhappy and you don't trust each other. It's hard when clients keep cutting fees and kind of arbitrarily going to client, uh, going to agencies and saying like, hey, we need 20% off this year, 30% off this year, but we really don't want to change the scope. Um, so I think part of this has to be those honest conversations up front that say like, okay, you know, you want things to be different. You want more transparency. You want to operate in a different way. This is what it means. And this is what it means for your business. This is what it means to the people in your business. This is how it's going to have to change moving forward. And I, I don't, I often don't see those conversations happening with the right people because the procurement person is not going to understand the nuances of what we're talking about. The people in the brand, they live it every day. They'll understand that. It's like, wait, what do you mean? I'm not going to have that anymore. Yeah, but, no, but, but the reality is we're never going to get out of the relationship with the procurement agents. The, the procurement agents are part of the shift that went on during the 80s where. I know, of, I know. You know it's, it's true. It's, we're not. But we have to figure out a way to to. I mean, what we what we were trying to do, at least, which seemed to work a little bit was, you know, you don't do that in isolation. You know, you could give context for what you're doing. You bring in the brand people when you need to. You have broader conversations with the team so that. You know, you're not just sitting there with somebody who only cares about the money and the bottom line, you know, um, that they that they actually will understand that there are implications and repercussions for, you know, some of this change of, of the way of working. And, and some are really great and positive and will move us forward and get, diff- you know, momentum and and other changes are going to be harder for the culture to swallow. But you need to understand both. 
You know, I, I, I like that vision of bringing in the players who are directly involved with it at the business to sit in the negotiations and provide a human perspective to the procurement negotiations. But Brandy, is there any incentive for that to happen? I mean, you don't bring the talent, you don't bring the, 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 the movie star to the negotiation table. You send the agent who hardballs <laughs> everything to get to the best number. So, I mean, this is, this is a, a great solution that Lynn's proposing, but how likely is it that something like that's going to happen considering the fact that it's a lousy negotiation tactic? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say lousy to go... Wow, that's so harsh, Bob. Thank you, Brandy. I'm I'm not making fun of Lynn. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. (laughs) But but, but keep in mind that the marketing people generally want that because they don't want to get screwed by something that they have to adhere to that they know isn't going to work. Of that, course. That's what I found. Of course they do. Of course they want to be involved with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. They want to have that happen. But again, you know, when you're talking about a company that is all about shareholder value and reducing cost and increasing value, you send the negotiator to the table. You don't send the people who are bleeding hearts and saying, oh, but we like them. <laughs> you don't want them sitting at the table. I mean, it's a bad <laughs> negotiation tactic. I do. I'm <laughs> <at> the table. <laughs> I know. You like we, need a, we need a little negotiating 101. You know, the UN does a lot of like yeah, negotiation totally. training and conflict resolution since, you know, Bob, you think those are lousy tactics. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, look, I'm not saying in a, in a perfect world, I agree 100%. I would rather have a friend sitting across me at the table, but I'm just saying there's no real legitimate reason to do that. <laughs> <There's> no... <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Well, moving on, Walmart oh, announced that they were... <laughs> I've got the last word. On we go. <laughs> Let it happen. Move us on. I was like, Move us what do you said, lousy? I was like, wow. I know, you're right? Harsh. 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 First uh, and last time I'll be on the beat. <laughs> oh, no, I've ruined it. I've ruined Let's it. Let's make it a good one. <laughs> well, Walmart announced that they were purchasing 11,000 Oculus Go VR units to be used in training employees and things such as customer service. So, Brandy, good move or just a lame PR effort? And how many of these things are still going to be at the stores within a week? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is really interesting. Walmart is a, is a dear client, so I, I'm just I'm, I'm going to speak as a as a consumer, as someone who shops at Walmart um, a lot, and as a marketing PR expert, right? So I think it's good and bad. This is, and I'll tell you why I think it's good and why I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and then I'll tell you why I'm a little concerned about it. Um, this is no, this is not new for Walmart with, with VR. Um, if you guys remember, and, and I am a faithful Black Friday, actually now I'm Thanksgiving night shopper at Walmart where you can get like these, you know, door buster deals that they have for an hour. But they they started doing VR. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Brandy. Did we just learn something about you that needs to be we pointed did. out? You we actually did. stand in line at Walmart. I do. <laughs> I am. Um, mom and I we have shirts that say Black Friday Warriors, and we do <laughs> oh stand in line at Walmart at 10 p.m. on Thanksgiving night. We leave our family after all the the cooking and eating is said and done. Our family thinks we're insane. We put our T-shirts on and we go to Walmart and, and we stand in line. And I can tell you it's the best social experiment I've ever been to. <laughs> it is You get a whole I, – I, there were emotions in me getting mm. one of my 60-inch televisions. I just did not know <laughs> I had in me after waiting in line at Walmart. So, yes. Oh, I am, my God. I love it. I am a Black Friday warrior and proud. That's very amazing. Proud that's a really amazing. So but go on with your story. <laughs> no, but with Black Friday, Walmart was using VR to train employees because I can just tell you the sheer volume of people, and you know, I'm, and I'm here in New York, Bob. So the sheer volume of people that go to Walmart on Thanksgiving, and we, and I've done it both in, in Louisiana and in New York because I'm originally from New Orleans. But the, they needed to train and have the employees ready as they have various, you know, just it changes every hour on what's on sale, what's in the store. So that, that they're no stranger to that. What I'm concerned, and I think it's a good idea to, to use VR headsets, the Oculus to train the employees 
if there's new technologies, if there's new things that they're selling, Walmart is, you know, steadily trying to keep up with Amazon, being a go-to, you know, for various things from clothing to appliances to gadgets or what have you. So in that respect, I think it's good because your employees, that's the worst when you ask one of the people in the blue vest where something is and they like look at you like, why are you asking me? I'm asking you because you work here. Like, what's wrong with <laughs> that? Exactly. Like, it is it is just it's that is infuriating and that happens all all too often at a Walmart. So I think that that is good. What concerns me about this is okay, they the article if you were to read, you know, any of the coverage, oh they're going to teach the employee, they're going to train the employees, um, you know, customer service. And this is the first time this will be at scale, you know, because it's all the Walmart stores and that's good. Yeah, woohoo. But it says also they're going to train them soft skills, which worries me. That worries me. All of us have had an experience, a good experience with the Walmart greeter, who's the average age, I don't know, 65, 70, who smiles and greets you when they when you come into the store. Most of us have had unpleasant experiences with the disgruntled Walmart employee who maybe has worked too many hours, is covering for someone who didn't show up for work, is dealing with you know a number of things that can take place. Do you really think a VR headset is going to train that person in a soft skill? That's human behavior. And honestly, I I don't think that soft skills are something you can teach. Either somebody is a nice person or knows how to act like an adult or, you know, social norms in a certain, or they don't. I I personally am concerned that you're going to say, well, you know, Bob can sometimes be real harsh and say things like lousy tactic but if he goes with his VR, <laughs> you're never going to let go of that, are you? <laughs> if, <laughs> if he goes with his VR Oculus, Bob is going to emerge like he's going to be a different man. He's going to be so polite and so nice. <laughs> he's going to be excellent. <laughs> at We're service. just laughing I, at that. <laughs> I just buy it. I just I don't buy it. So I just I, I want to make sure that they use it, and I think it's good if it works at scale for customer service, for training, so that the employees know what's new, what's hot. What, what are the, like, I would love to, to find out or ask a Walmart, what are the, the 10 most frequently asked questions a Walmart employee gets? 10 most frequently asked questions. Train them in that so that they're prepared. You know, it's, you know, it's almost like people who go to McDonald's and stare at the menu. It doesn't change. Why are you staring at the menu? They but, offer but the same thing. Can you, Brandy, can you imagine that they're already doing something like that? That they're already, you know, serving the questions that are most asked by employees and doing training and it's just not sinking in? And they're looking for a, a device to make it more realistic and make it more a part of the experience so that they can... They can own it mentally, not just complete a test and and go off onto the you know, onto the showroom floor and and just act the way they want to act. I mean, it, this is more about making the experience real, uh, if I understand the article correctly. Right, the, that's what the article is. But my my issue with it is it's a cultural it's a culture thing. And you and Lynn talked about this at the beginning, you know, answering the questions from kicking off the podcast around culture. I think it's it's a it's a culture thing. Now you say, oh, I would assume that they're already doing this training. I am telling you, I am a very loyal Walmart. I'm in, I'm in Walmart at least four or five times a month, and mm. I every time I'm in there, the Walmart employee has like no idea what I'm talking about, and I don't. And I'm in there so much. I'm like, really? Like you don't know what I'm talking about? Or if I see a commercial, or I go online, and then I go in the store. So somewhere the training isn't sticking. And if you think it's just this is just about training the employees, I, I still don't think they they have it right. Again, Black Friday, yes, I do applaud them because a lot goes on on Black Friday. Things change. There's a lot of people. But just uh, if you go to a Walmart at you know 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, I, I, I'm not going to say the customer service is excellent. I'm not, I'm not going to say that because it's not. Lynn, what's your take on this? I mean, it's just like I would I would love for you to respond to Brandy or not to agree with her either way. But I mean, yeah. you know, your your consultancy is all about looking at new ways to change culture. Would VR give people an opportunity to own something mentally that they couldn't get through regular training? So I am kind of in a a little bit of divided place on this because on one hand, there's a lot of evidence that when people experience something or they trick their brain into thinking they're experiencing something for real, it sticks. 
So whether that's learning English because you're immersed in New York City and your, you know, your VR experience is putting you in a place where you can actually use the language versus just, you know, rote, I don't know. But I think there is, I think there's, there's applicability in training different skills in VR as long as there's AI, an AI component to it. I think VR alone is not enough. And by the way, there's a lot of huge spectrum of good VR and bad VR, right? We haven't talked about that, but like, you know, I think if the if, if the software and the AI is is sophisticated enough to give a good training experience, then you can you can deliver that. Now, where I where I where the, the the part of my mind that's divided goes is, I think Brandy's right in the sense of some people are just not trainable. I mean, come on, you know, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's it's it's. It's reality, right? Like you just can't put this silver bullet out there and go, oh, now everything's going to be perfect because exactly. we gave everybody this training. Exactly. You know, <laughs> so I think it'll help some people. Yes. And some people will remember and it'll stick and it's better than the current training they're going through, which I guarantee is crappy. Right. Like, the, I, have you ever done those, those, those video, you know, ethic courses, you know, click, click, it's horrible. Yeah, so yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've had I, to go through I'm one recently. I'm just saying, you know, there, there's an improvement. The bar is so low on so much training that this will at least lift the bar. Does it solve the problems and make everybody a great employee? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, you still have to hire good people. You still have to, you know, assume that they, you know, um, well, can greet somebody with a smile. You know, it's like basic human stuff, right? Yeah, let's exactly. think. Let's think ten thousand feet, though, just for a second. Let's think about this from a standpoint of recruitment. Does it? Does the fact that the words out on the street now, at least that's what I'm assuming is happening with this story, that you know Walmart has VR goggles as part of their training, and that people who go through it say, "Oh man, I got VR training today," and that gets other people who are interested in technology to apply for jobs at Walmart. So, does it improve mm -hmm. the type of applicant over time by having this kind of technological? Uh, advancement put into play as part of the training at Walmart? That's a loaded question because I think that I think there's some degree to an age uh, or a generational barrier to that. Because if I asked my mom to, and my mom is lovely, and this is not a knock on moms, but if I asked her to put some goggles on, and she's an HR director, um, if I asked her to put some goggles on and was like, hey, this will get you top talent, she'd be like, what? Well, I would like to just sit down and really talk to people as opposed right. to like she's still gonna and I, so I think that there's I think that's a again a loaded question because generationally now if you're talking about you know people who are looking you know high school graduates you graduate from college yeah to have a VR experience you know as far as a as a tactic to be trained to attract you to a company absolutely but what about the mid-level or the senior level um executive who you can't say hey, we're going to be using VR to attract top talent and then so you bring, you know, talent into the organization and you yourself don't know how to use that, that's like, that's fraudulent, right? It's like, oh, we're touting this technology, but we don't use it in, you know, we don't know how to use it our ourselves or what have you. So it's a, it's a tough question because I think, of course, um, Generation Z, and I heard now the new generation, the, the ones that were born the, in 2001 with 9-11, are now called Generation Alpha. I think we're starting over. Oh. Um, but they're alpha. I was just told that a couple mm. couple days ago. Um, yeah, that's appealing to them. Sure. Oh my gosh, Walmart's doing VR training. That's cool. I've always wanted a pair of Oculus. Like that's amazing. But again, is is someone mid level co career? Maybe someone who's looking to go back to work after the kids have left, are they going to like jump for joy that they get VR training? I, I can't say that. Which goes back to my original supposition that most of these are going to get stolen within the first <laughs> couple months. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, statistically, I don't know if you guys know this, statistically, there's more theft in Target than there is in Walmart, statistically. Uh, we're not talking about, we're not talking about general floor st stealing. We're talking <laughs> about employee stealing, which is a whole different exactly. level of acts. That, <laughs> again, statistically, there's more theft in Target than there is in Walmart. Mm -hmm. We can read all <laughs> kinds of things into that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to the final topic of the evening. Look out, duopoly. Amazon is nipping at your heels. Amazon is passing Oath and Microsoft to become number three in online ad revenue just behind Google and Facebook. Well, maybe not just behind, but getting close. 
<laughs> so, Lynn, is there any stopping Amazon, or is it inevitable that they will one day surpass all players online? Is this a trajectory that is not going to end? So I saw this, and I was like, yawn, really? I mean, come on, we know this. This is not news. I'm sorry. It's not news. So, um, yeah, I think as, and I'm an Amazon, um, shareholder. So, you know, transparency there, I want Amazon to just keep going. Right. Cause that's good. Now I will still say my comments very in the very beginning around consolidation is, is still true. You know, you don't, you, you want, you want competition, you know, and the competition has to be good competition and that's good for everybody. But having said that, um, I don't think there is any stopping Amazon. I think um, Facebook in particular is, you know, a challenge these days for a lot of reasons. Um, I think Amazon, given that they own the ecosystem, it just makes perfect sense that, of course, they're going to get all this ad revenue. I think the more interesting questions around Amazon is where they're going to go next, right? I'm sitting here in Colorado I got to believe if if Amazon decided to to get into the cannabis business, <laughs> I mean, look at the stock price, right? But um, the reality is they could really own the complete chain. They could own the uh, farms. They could put it in Whole Foods. They could actually uh, put dispensaries out of business by being able to distribute and deliver through drones. And there you go. That's the next Amazon. So sorry. So, so Lynn, can I just ask you something about it's a, it's a hot button, and I try not to talk about Amazon again because it's, it's I'm in a, I'm in a tricky spot. But according to some some analysts, that Amazon Web Services, which is the cloud based business, um, that the ad spend is going to outpace Web Services, right? Yes. So if the op, if Web Services is making you know they're on par to make however many billion. Just want to say IBM's still making more, um, but they're supposed to make they're supposed to make in like the next two years like some number, but in the next two years the ad ad revenue is going to surpass that, right? Because you're dealing with direct to consumer and then business to business, right? Sure. Because they they're doing both. So if ad revenue and like to your very point about them take they you know the the sky's the limit they can take over you know integrating into whole foods and if they wanted to get into cannabis and all these various <laughs> things with ad sales does that mean the technology piece is is no longer relevant to them and that legacy and traditional players you know will continue to reclaim that re reclaim that market share or are they going to try to do too much and be real real big at a lot of different things Whoa, that is a big question. Know, that was a lot. That is a big question. It's a really good question. And I'm glad to leave Lynn to answer it. So you take it away, Lynn. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that because that's a tough question to answer. But I I think, um, you know, like any big company, I mean, you could say Google's in the same position. You know, how much do you, do you kind of feed into your legacy business, right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. continue, to, continue to mine and milk and grow that versus pushing out into all these other innovation right. areas. And I, that's just a, that to me is a question that is about survival and how you get ahead in today's business. And I think more and more, the reality is legacy businesses need to evolve. And that's just kind of where, what you got to do. So, you know, the companies that are able to sort of look ahead and see where the trends are and go there, even if it means challenging their current business, I think are the ones that are going to end up in better shape. Which, so that's which, not really an answer, but it's sort of... No, a, no, no, it's fair. No, I just was curious. Yeah. It's fair. Well, it's but fair. that leads me to the last question on this topic, which is, do we really believe that Google is not that company? Is that Google is not the nimble player who challenges accepted norms, who has revenue via some of the, the fastest growing areas of the internet right now? I mean, with both YouTube and the ad sales business that they have going on with the search engine. I mean, you know... Yeah, Amazon severely challenges that with intent to buy, but Google still rules intent to find. And that I think that's an important distinction that we need to keep in mind. I mean, yeah, Facebook is seriously challenged, but I don't know whether or not Amazon has it in them to surpass Google as the most important search engine or the most important ad revenue no, generator online. I don't online. think they can. I agree with you. I don't I think agree they can. I agree with that too. Yeah, I think Google owns that. And I think the more that search becomes visual, 
and uh, image oriented. And even, you know, hey, I was I was talking to a friend of mine who does scent marketing. She's like, why can't you search scents? Imagine that. Like, you know, so you think about the potential for even the upside of where Google can go with what they can already do and push that out. And there's still a lot of room. So I, I agree with you. I don't think Google's going anywhere uh, at all. Um, but I also think Amazon, you know, Amazon's got a lot of runway and um, there seems to be no stopping them. Well, that's a good place for us to wrap up. It's time for the Ad <laughs> Fail 5. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Brandy Boatner. You can find her at ibm.com. It's a really easy web address and a really big <laughs> company. And she's got a very long title, as we remember. Right. So tell us, what's going on in your world, Brandy? What would you like to promote? So I'd like to promote, we had a really large announcement on Wednesday um, our speaking of trust and transparency principles around artificial intelligence and AI ethics. You all might have seen something, you know, cracking the black box of AI. It's not as creepy as it sounds, but it's actually pretty amazing that, you know, the difference between good tech and bad tech. So I would encourage everyone listening to check out the trust and transparency principles around artificial intelligence uh, by IBM. It's a good read. And, uh, you know, if you, if you like it, you can try to adopt it in your company. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. So definitely check that out. And Lynn Power, you can find her at thehmsbeagle.com. It is the home of a consultancy that she is founded with Mr. Joseph Jaffe. I'll let her take it away. Tell us what you'd like to talk about. What would you like to promote? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, new consultancy. We're really officially launching in about a week, which is really exciting. Although we've been working with a couple clients thus far. Um, and we are in the business of helping brands navigate survival. You know, it just feels like that's not a given these days, whether you're a legacy brand or even a startup. Obviously, we know startups have their own challenges or, you know, you just need to return to growth. Um, so that's that's our laser focus. And we're just having a lot of fun right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I loved your vision that you expressed to me when we were talking earlier this week. So that's fantastic. Really, really happy for you. And as for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. You can even find out how to advertise on the program. So check that out at thebeancast.com. And don't forget, you can now get transcription live on thebeancast.com for every episode. It comes out about a week after the episode posts. Um, this is because transcribeme.com is our official transcription partner. So if you would like transcription services, please go to transcribeme.com slash beancast. They'll give you a special offer on your first transcription. And now it's time for the Ad Fail 5, a rundown of the lowest moments in advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. And first up, Subway tried to troll McDonald's, Lynn, with a campaign that prominently featured the Golden Arches flatlining which, as it turned out, just wound up confusing and irritating customers for a range of reasons, mostly because it looks just like a McDonald's ad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this one, uh, how did this get through? <laughs> you know, this is one of those things that I'm like, that is almost never a good idea. Like, oh, let's show our competitor's logo in the ad and not even talk about ourselves really. And just, it, it just makes no sense. So I just think it was a terrible idea. Um, the only successful competitive ads, and I frame competitive as in like featuring your competition that, that I can really think about, are ones where you're really uh, challenging, right? Like, like Mac versus PC. But when you're just basically um, advertising your competitor, I mean, it, 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 it's kind of ridiculous. It made yeah, no, I don't know what to say. It it's, made no <laughs> sense to me. It really it made didn't. no sense. <laughs> well, next up, Yandy, an online retailer of costumes, is the latest company to not quick, quite get the memo on Ooh. what The Handmaid's Tale is all about, Brandy, as they yep. marketed their sexy Handmaid's costume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is twofold for me, just to fail. So Yandy, I have purchased costumes from Yandy. Again, I ha I'm a consumer of this brand. But I also, a very dear girlfriend of mine, works for uh, a large Halloween, actually the largest Halloween costume retailer. And she tells me that they have 
like literally critical meetings every year as to like what is a safe costume and what is not a safe costume because you can imagine people want costumes ranging from the president to you know a, a variety of people but again what they will sell and you know to be practitioners of good business and to be culturally sensitive and all this thing it's a huge process for them the fact that Yandy <laughs> didn't not only do that <laughs> on what you know since you know they they had the sexy handmaid at any point did anyone sit around the room and say have any of us ever watched the handmaiden like just anybody that yeah, works there well, like, say, yeah that's a good we should binge watch it or we should like did anybody even think to do it and then they have the egg on their face to pull it because they were insensitive it's just <laughs> it, it's just unbelievable i mean i won't even get into it but I know. when I you when, know. You, when you tear the, it apart it's like killed, go ahead uh, oh i was just gonna say the thing that killed me is not only did they do the handmaid's tail costume but they tried to make it like a sexy one <laughs> right like short because you know how they wear short. long their things yes. are long it was short. I think it was short. Was it was short. And I'm like, it oh, was like, no, you don't even understand that's not what they look like. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, oh. next up, the Ad ID Consortium, a coalition of ad tech looking to break the duopoly's grip on ad spend, seems to have been broken by another monopoly here, Lynn. Um, AT and T <laughs> bought one of the key players, App Nexus and is withdrawing them from the consortium. So I guess what this means is be a monopoly because monopolies are cool and AT&T wants to be a monopoly. <laughs> I don't know. I just think the whole consortium idea, it's like, yeah, let's all get together and create this, you know, unified point of view on, on this. It's, it's just, like I said earlier, easier said than done. And um, obviously, you know, people are kind of peeling off left and right. So I think that sort of says enough. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> now, next up, Eminem, the rapper, took out a full page ad in The Hollywood Reporter to blast okay. critics who panned his latest album, Brandy. Okay. Diss track or sore loser? What's your take on this one? <laughs> sore loser. Come on, Marshall. Now, I'm a, I'm a fan, but you need to, everybody knows that if you if you don't like someone that said something about you, everybody knows you do a diss track. So do a diss track, or, you know, critics, and he's done them before. But to take out the ad to really, which really screamed, I'm still relevant, I'm still relevant, it's a total sore loser. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I I agree, but the, the funny thing about this one, I was like, okay, first of all, he took out a print ad. Like, seriously, <laughs> that's so old school. That's like saying, yes, I am old. Right, I'm still relevant. Touch. No, it was Lynn, it's taking out a I'm print old. ad. I'm relevant. Right? Please don't forget me. Don't forget but me. in a print ad. I know. Oh, I'm like, man. that's ridiculous. It really, and that, but of oh, course, we're black. sitting here, but we're sitting here talking about it. That's the flip side, right? Like, the fact that you're like bringing it up and we're having a conversation about him, he's getting PR because of it. We and don't. Maybe that count. was the intent all along. One thing that I've learned about the conversations that go on this show, we don't count when it comes to the general public. <laughs> <laughs> we're I just speak for yourself, okay. Bob. I think yeah. <laughs> Brandy's big, all right? Well. Lynn is bigger. <laughs> i don't know i think i've got you all beat i'm six foot five so i'm the biggest you you win, you win. <laughs> all right. and the aclu is claiming that facebook has been allowing job posters on their platform to target male candidates only you know every time you turn around the targeting functions on facebook show up another crack i don't know whether to necessarily say that anybody was taking these tools and using it just to target males instead of females when they were going for job postings. But I mean, Lynn, it doesn't sound good and it doesn't look good to have this functionality be exposed by the ACLU. <laughs> no, it doesn't look good. And I feel like this is just another situation where Facebook really wants to just be like, no, we just kind of put the tools and the platform out there, but don't really want to take accountability for the content that actually goes out. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a hot button these days, right? So you just, you just can't, you just can't ignore that. Now I do think there are like 10 or so companies also though, that were kind of responsible alongside Facebook. And I would say to them, like, seriously, people like get with the program. Do you not understand that? You know, police officers can be both genders, <laughs> you know, multiple <laughs> genders, they not Mul multiple the genders of inclusion. You know? Everybody. Yes. 
deserves a right. chance. You have to be I mean, inclusive. it's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's like, really? Yeah, yeah. This Agreed. one, this one really, really got under my skin, but it was, it was funny nonetheless. So we put it on the ad fail. Well, have something to add to this list or just want to discuss it, comment online. Use the hashtag AdFail5. That's pound, AdFail, and the number five. Well, that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an iTunes listener, we've also provided a direct link to the iTunes Music Store or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory of iTunes. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then.